My name is Vras Gohan. Um, I hope you hear me well. Uh, I'm the head of DevOps at Permit.io, and today I wanted to talk with you about policy as code, about how it can actually change your, your way that you basically look at your security all across your stack. Um, so starting from the DevOps, from the infrastructure, going through uh, the backend, maybe databases, and also uh, the frontend. And we will start by actually understanding what authorization, authentication, access control means. I will start by scaring you a bit uh, why it is such an important thing. And then we will understand how we can solve everything by policy as code. It's not that simple, but I will, I will try to convince you that it's simple. So let's start. So first of all, welcome everyone to KubeCon Paris. I hope you're doing a uh, good time here. For me, it's amazing. It's good food, good weather, so I'm doing good. And there are a lot of, I don't know, interesting com uh, companies here. Uh, everyone is trying to integrate AI inside their product, so it's nice to see actually how it's getting traction, and, I don't know, getting some improvements through the time. And eventually we all have one goal, doesn't matter if you are DevOps, doesn't matter if you are data analyst, developer, product manager, we all have one simple goal and it's to get our application to production, right? And that can be simple, but through the time we understand that there are a lot of small things that are, will make our life really miserable, um, but we did it. We deployed our application to production. We are super excited about it. And now we need to understand what else? We can just, you know, we made it. But unfortunately, this is not enough. And most of the time we understand that deploying and, you know, making a nice CI CD, making a well-performance uh, code, it's not enough. And you guessed it right. We always have this small pull request that says urgent security fixes. Um, starting from vulnerabilities in our code or, I don't know, maybe other cloud misconfigurations and stuff like this. Um, and this is nice, um, but this is not solving all the security issues that we have. And we can talk about security again around the code, maybe in the Docker image or something like this, but we can't forget the security inside our application. So. The first step that I'm going to talk about, or the first, first thing, basically, is authentication. And authentication is something very, very important, because if you think about it, maybe our code is very secure, but maybe everyone can access my application. Maybe it's, you know, free, free for all and, you know, just come in, do whatever you want, but no, we need to first build this first gate uh, of who can access my application. And for this, we have many tools, many open sources. I won't uh, say the names, but you can guess it and you can understand that today authentication is something that you can just take, maybe pay, maybe uh, deploy it yourself using open source, but you can do it yourself, basically, using other tools. So it's very nice. Um, but this is really the first Thing. So authentication will be kind of the first gate, and then, okay, you are logged into my application, but what can you do in the application? That's a Im very important question that we need to solve, and think about it. Maybe I'm developing an insurance application, so what will happen if you log in and see other customer or other users' uh, insurance documents or something like this? Maybe a medical application. So. This stuff should be controlled somehow, right? And the next step will be authorization. So this is really the difference between authentication and authorization. Authentication, again, is just the first gate, understanding who is the user, and the second step will be understanding what the user can do. So it all ends up always like this. You know, just create a ticket for this. We don't have time. Doesn't matter if you're a startup. Doesn't matter if you're a big company. It's always, uh, let's just build something very, very easy. Uh, just create a, an admin role and everything will be all right. Um, but most of the cases, uh, it's not good enough. 
And we will create this ticket, but unfortunately, we will also have to implement this authorization layer someday. So I'm not here just to give you an edict about what is authorization. I'm, I'm here also to make you understand that authorization and access control is very, very important. So OWASP, for those of you who don't know, it's the Open Worldwide Application Security Project. I'm also, I need to read it because it's too long. Um, but they released every few years kind of a nice top 10 list of the risks uh, of application security. Sometimes they release an API security risks or something like this, something more specific. But this is the really the uh, kind of the general list. So you can see in 2017, uh, they basically claimed that broken access control, uh, it was in the fifth place, but it, it had a good place, I think. And authentication, you can see, was in the second place. Um, and you can see that in 2021, it became not only the first place, um, we will see in a second that it, it got many places, not only the first place, but it really went from the fifth to the first. So it's not only a risk, it's a very, very impactful and it's very, very important to take care of. And also you can start looking at the list and try to find authentication. Authentication got a new name on the seventh place. It's called identification and authentication failures. I don't know why they call it like this. Um, but basically, what I understand is that authentication is not such a big deal right now. Because we have this, all of these products and tools that I showed you. That's great. And now we need tools also for broken access control, broken authorization, right? So also in 2023, they released, OWASP released a top 10 API security risks. So this is more specifically, oh, that's interesting because I can see it. Okay. Interesting. Um, that can be my next talk maybe. Uh, anyway, on the top 10 risks of API security risks, uh, they said not only that the first place will go for broken object level authorization, which is me, uh, they gave also the third place, which is broken object property level authorization, and the fifth place. So they gave it many names. I don't know why, but it got three places in the scary list of uh, you need to take care of this right now. So after scaring you a bit, I'm going to scare you a bit more. So this is, these are stories about companies that did authorization and access control not good enough. And I can tell you a secret. Uh, Everybody is not doing it enough, good enough. Uh, but Uber admits covering up massive uh, kind of data breach that caused by broken access control. MailChimp, uh, it was act again again by access, broken access control. Microsoft Exchange servers are suffering from zero-day exploits. Um, I think a few months after or before it happened for them again, so poor Microsoft. And First American and Cambridge Analytica. All of these stories are basically uh, me trying to scare you that you need to do authorization better. Okay, that's, that's kind of it. And this was the scary part, and now I'm going to tell you how we can do it together a bit better. So starting by introduce myself. So I'm Raz Cohen. I'm an entrepreneur from Israel. I'm 26 years old. You can see all the things. Yeah. So I'm a web surfer. I'm a best player. I'm passionate about traveling and food. That's why I love Paris. And I have eight years of experience in development, DevOps, uh, platform, I don't know, you name it. Um, and that's kind of it. I'm going to talk about policy as code now. So before, one, one moment before, I wanted to say that um, currently we are building in Permit.io kind of a full stack solution, end-to-end -end solution uh, that will basically uh, trying to give engineers uh, the, basically the solution to not build access control again. So one moment we will meet Sandy. So Sandy will be our developer for today. And Sandy is basically, again, doesn't matter if she's in a startup or in a big company, corporate, she's trying to build her application right now. 
And she's trying to build authorization because she got this ticket from her manager and now she's trying to understand what she needs to do. So she will try to build something very, very basic. So the first thing she will try to do is building kind of a middleware inside her code. And this middleware, she called it uh, OffZ, which is a short name for authorization. And what she's doing basically is something very, very basic. Like I said before, she's giving the opportunity to, to her developers to kind of assign admins to specific endpoints. So now she has this document endpoint, which is like creating a new document in her API. And now she's protecting this API endpoint using this role called admin. She can basically change it to a different role, but it's only one role. So an admin and non-admin kind of model, that's what she built right now. And obviously that's not enough. That might be nice for the first couple of days. Um, so she tried to do something a bit better. She's trying to build kind of a multi-role uh, access control. I will give it a good, better name in a, in a second. But what she's trying to do is basically protect a specific endpoint using few roles. So you can see here that not only an admin can access the document or maybe delete a document or you say whatever. Now also a paying user can do so. So if you are paying, good, you can create and delete a document. If you're, I don't know, an admin, also good. But if you are a reader, that's not enough. And that's what we call in the industry uh, role-based access control. And you might have heard about it mostly in Kubernetes or stuff like this. Also Kubernetes is using uh, role-based access control. So on the right side, you can see a pretty, pretty simple example. So you have Joe, which is a viewer. Uh, unfortunately, viewer cannot delete a document, but he can read a document, uh, delete and read, yeah. And Sandy, she's an admin, so she will be able to delete a document and also read a document. Again, very, very basic. And this uh, model, policy model, role-based access control is widely used in many, many applications. Uh, you, you name it, again, I said Kubernetes, and uh, that's a good uh, example, I think. And also, it's really easy to define. So for Sandy, it will be very easy. It gives her a kind of a good moment to finish the ticket. And she's saying, OK, good. Uh, let's, let's move on, right? But unfortunately, a really high demanding consumer comes to her manager or comes to the product manager, I don't know. Uh, and he says, um, please. Role-based is not enough. We need something that will help us to not only observe the user, but also observe the resource that he's trying to, to interact with. Or maybe I want to know better my user. Maybe my user is now from Paris, but I want him to be able to interact with other resources only from France or from Europe or stuff like this. So this is why we need smarter policy. And this is why we need attributes. So. In this example, again, I'm not going to too much uh, drill down in this code, but in this example, we can see in the API endpoint section that Sandy enhanced this decorator a bit, and now it can also accept key and a value. So you can see that now this API endpoint accepts a, a role, which is an admin, but now, a, like, he will be able, the decorator will be able to also accept uh, a key and a value, which is location and Paris. So you can, you guess it right. Now also an admin that is located in Paris will be able to access the document. And not only this, I can say maybe that um, if the user is using a device, which is a phone, he will be also able to do specific stuff. We can say whatever, basically. We can, inject any data that we want. And by this, we can basically inspect the user. And not only inspect the user, we can also inspect the resource that he's trying to uh, interact with. So maybe I want to say that the document is a specific document. Maybe I want the user to be able to interact with only uh, data sheets or maybe DB kind of document. I don't know. So that was attribute-based access control. And on the right side, you can see Sandy, and Sandy is from, is an, she's an admin, but 
sometimes she, she's from the US and I will not let her kind of delete documents that are somehow related to European documents. And only when she's from Paris, I will let her to do so. So this policy is becoming a bit more complex, a bit more smarter. And uh, not only that we are able to now inspect and make much smarter decision making, we can handle also multiple data sources. So if you think about it, now I can take the data not only from my DB, I can take data maybe from other APIs, maybe from Stripe, Salesforce, and I can somehow integrate this data to my policy. Okay, so this can be very, very interesting. And now we can build a much complex, uh, more complex kind of policy. Uh, it's really, really scalable. But unfortunately, as, as long as you're pushing more data and trying to handle more data sources, it's becoming a mess and it's really hard to maintain. So keep that in mind. Also configuration can be a nightmare. And now another customer comes and this customer asks for relationships. And this can be a bit confusing, so I will give a good examples of what relationships mean, what relationships in policy means. And for this example, I will take Sandy and Joe again. And Sandy now, Sandy now she's an owner of a folder. So let's say that Sandy now is an owner of the R&D folder, for example. Uh, so she will be able to delete a file. Joe is just a viewer of a folder. So Joe will not be able to delete a file that located in this folder. Another example that I can give here is that Sandy, Sandy she's not a, an owner of the folder of marketing, right? Uh, so she will not be able neither to view, delete, create documents under the marketing folder. So that's also important to understand. Some good examples of relationships based access control that we have today uh, that I guess most of you are familiar with. So we have, um, we have GitHub and GitHub now kind of trying to model their access control with organizations and repos. So think about it. I, I am a part of Permit.io organization so I can maintain, I can push code to my repos under Permit.io, but I cannot push repos under, let's say, some other company's repos. Maybe I do, I don't know, but for sure I cannot delete the repos. So that's something important to understand. This is the relationship. So the organization is the owner of a repo. And in Google Drive, we have something uh, a bit more complex, but easy to understand. So we have directories, we have folders, and inside the folders, we have files, like, just like I said. So on the left side, you can see also the example of, I want to share the specific folder or the specific file with someone. So I can invite someone. I can say that he's now an owner, or maybe she's a viewer on this file. And by this, I can share access to my folder. And by sharing the access to my folder, I'm also sharing access to all the uh, documents and files inside of it. And in Permit.io, we call it uh, role derivation, basically. Uh, that's how we wanted to make uh, our user understand better what relationships are. So if I gave you a role of a specific uh, instance of an object, I want you to have the roles, all of the hierarchy inside of it. So that's how we call it. We call it role derivation. And relationship-based access control, again, is it's a bit complex, but the easiest way to think about it is when we are talking about graphs. So think about graph-based uh, database, and now think that we are building all of your application, all of your objects inside of the application with kind of graphs and connections. So you have the entity, let's say a user or API key, doesn't really matter. Maybe in the next few months it will be an AI, AI agent, and now this AI agent needs some kind of access, right? And once I give this AI agent an access on my organization, maybe now this AI agent can do whatever he wants 
it wants on my organization, which is very scary, right? So we want to build a good relationship-based access control, which limits and also create good access to my entities. And when we are talking about graphs, I need you to stay with me with the graphs because with relationship-based access control, what we can do is not only ask, maybe Sandy can delete a file, or do Sandy, does Sandy can maybe create a folder. Uh, we can also ask the opposite. We can ask the reverse of this question. So we can ask maybe who can access this file, right? And when this comes into graphs, it's very easy to understand and very easy to answer, right? Because it's just going through the graph and using a simple database will not be enough here. So most of the times when we are developing this relationship-based access control, most of the time it's really in graphs. Um, and with this claim, we can understand that it's also very easy to scale, right? Because, I don't know, we have this graph and now we have 10 billion of entities that's good. We understand better and we can answer pretty quickly. But as soon as this graph is getting really, really big, we need to understand that the performance might be a bit not that good. Um, also, a good example here is Google. So Google released in 2019 a white paper called uh, Google Zanzibar. For those of you who know or don't know, Google Zanzibar is kind of a white paper for released by Google that uh, giving us a teaser about how they manage permissions and fine grain uh, access control and authorization on their platforms on Google Drive or all of their uh, suite of uh, tools. So you can also access this white paper and try to understand. And also there are a lot of open sources that are trying to implement Google Zanzibar into their own open sources. So this is really nice. I will talk about it in a second. Um, but as you understood, it's really, really, really hard to implement yourself and maintain. So I really don't recommend to do it. Just grab a tool, grab a product. Uh, the market is, I think, mature enough to offer this kind of services now. Um, and also, as I showed you in Google Drive, we have this UI, nice UI that we can share my uh, document, I can share my folder, and these interfaces are always needed. Think about it. We have good access control, but what about when we want to share the access control to other users? Maybe I'm a user in the insurance app, and I, uh, now I want access to my, I don't know, my children or my other uh, family member insurance. So I need this kind of good front-end interface that will let me do so. So this is also something that we need to take care of. So I talked about three policy models that are fairly and really uh, important to understand and really used in the industry, uh, which was role-based, attribute-based, and relationship-based access control. And we need to understand that authorization are, is really everywhere. It's not only on the back end, like I showed that Sandy developed, uh, unfortunately for Sandy, she will need to develop the same thing for her front end and maybe the DevOps and the infrastructure. She will need to, to understand what she's doing. And what I'm talking about is that on the infrastructure side, if you think about it, we deploy a new code, right? We maybe um, deploy a new Terraform or Pulumi kind of infrastructure. And maybe we destroy an old component and maybe we do specific stuff that is really, really dangerous. So we also need to understand how we do it good and not destroying stuff without any permission, right? We need also access control on my uh, infrastructure. The same goes for the front end. So we need to understand how we develop good uh, interfaces like I talked a second before. And also, if you think about it, let's say I'm a paying user on my application right now, but uh, other customer is not paying, and I don't want him to be able to see the buttons on the front end. So I need to hide these buttons for non-paying users. And this thing called uh, feature toggling or um, feature flagging, you can say, you can call it whatever. Um, the backend is what we talked until now, protecting our endpoints. Uh, when we're talking about data, for example, um, 
that becomes a bit more complex. So think about it. I want to send queries to my database, but only queries that the user can send. I don't want my user to be able to send queries that he's not um, permitted to do, right? And that's uh, how we call uh, partial evaluation. We want to be able to send specific queries to the DB. And unfortunately, we always have these legacy services that we need to take care about. This is not something I'm going to explain how because I really don't know how. Um, and again, we have more things that we need to take care of. So we need the performance to be well, right? Because if every endpoint call to my API um, becomes a bit, let's say, maybe half a second slower, that means that every API call to my backend will be slower because of my authorization. So I need to take care of that my authorization layer is very, very fast um, and well, for, well performing. I need to take care of my monitoring because, again, how can I know that my authorization is slow uh, if I don't have a monitoring or good monitoring system on, my, on the authorization layer? By this, I also have and I also need audit logs because what happens if some, some kind of a user gets access to a specific file that it doesn't shouldn't have permit, permission to see this file or something like this. So I need to understand what's the permissions that my user are getting. Um, about user management, so this is the UI and front-end interfaces that I talked about. And this comes in many, many colors and ways to implement. And unfortunately, we need also to operate this thing and maintain this thing to understand how we can maybe deploy a new policy or stuff like this. And with this, I'm coming, um, so we have more things. We have also compliance and security that we need to take care of. Um, and we also have other stakeholders that we need to think about, right? We have maybe customer success management and uh, product managers, and we need to understand how we give them the power to control the policy. Because if my policy is inside the code, uh, I'm doomed because every new policy means new version of my code. But if my product manager says, okay, now I want the policy to be a bit different, that means that we need to create a new ticket for this, for the R&D. But that's not what I want. I want my product manager to be able to change the policy however he wants, right? Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about the top five best practices that I think are the most uh, important about authorization. So we have the uh, agnostic to the permissions model. And to explain a bit about this, I want to be able to kind of develop my permission model. Doesn't matter if I want role-based or attribute-based, or I want to maybe plug in another third parties that I want to get the information from and the data from. So I want to be able uh, to be agnostic to the model that I'm choosing. Um, I want to decouple the policy from the code, which is very important and I'm going to elaborate on this in a second. Um, support the whole stack, so we talked about it. We have the front end, we have the back end, DBs. We need one authorization layer. We don't want five authorization layers. And also, if we have three microservices in our backend, I don't want that every microservice will be uh, will need another authorization layer. I want all of these microservices to use the same. Performance and monitoring we covered, and let's move on. So, I wanted to talk about decoupling uh, the policy from the code, and by this move a bit to policy as code. So today, the kind of the top tools that we have today to manage policy uh, using code, but not in our logic, not in our backend code. Um, so we have open policy agent, which is fairly, uh, is very uh, well known, I think. Kubernetes is using it and Gatekeeper, if you know. AWS Cedar, so AWS released an open source called Cedar. I think in January 2023, and it became really uh, mature by the time. And OpenFGA, which is also an open source that tried to implement Google Zanzibar, like we talked before. So today, in order to manage your policy in a good way, 
we have few things that we need to take care of. So first of all, we have the data. So we talked about the data. The data can come from many places, maybe third parties, maybe DBs, APIs. But as soon as we have the data, we can continue to write the policy. So now we have the policy, and you can choose which one to, to use. If you choose Open Policy Agent, you now can re, uh, develop and implement the policy using Rebgo or using Cedar, um, if you're using AWS Cedar. Um, but as soon as you develop your policy, good, you're good to go. You have the data and you have the policy, and basically that's what you need, right? As soon as you have the policy and as soon as you have the data, you're good to go. But think about it, what will happen now that you change the data constantly and you change the policy constantly. And now a new user logs in, that means new data. And maybe you develop a new feature, that means new policy, right? So you need to understand how you version control it and deploy it in a good way. So for this, we have policy as code. Policy as code basically gives us Everything that I said now, everything that GitOps will give you. Um, so it means version control uh, on our policies. Think about it. I'm pushing to Git now new policy. And that means that I need to get an approval and code review, right? And that covers the uh, tests, that covers the deployments um, that I, really, I can really build in a good way. And authorization for authorization, if you think about it, as soon as I'm pushing my policy to Git, now I need someone to review it. I need someone to approve it. And this is basically, if you think about it, I need access control to my access control. So using Git, doesn't matter if it's GitHub, GitLab, you can basically implement all of these concepts really, really easily. Uh, and I think the most important thing is really the deployment and rollback. Because once you developed a bad access control, like, you sh like I showed you before, uh, bad things can happen. Maybe insurance can be now exposed to everyone and maybe, I don't know, medical bills can now be exposed. So we need to be able to roll back really, really fast in, in case something happens, right? And again, in what world is just GitOps? So for this, um, we developed in, um, in Permit Opal. Um, Opal means Open Policy Administration Layer. It's, it's really a mature project now, uh, used by many companies. I won't name drop now, but you can see on the side. Um, and Opal gives you basically what I just mentioned. It gives you policy as code out of the box. So we'll start from the left side. So basically, Opal is built with the server and client architecture. So we will split it into two subjects. One is the server. We'll start with the server and just understand that the server basically holds a state of my repo. So I just said I want to control my policy using a git. So Opal server just always watch, always watch and see if there is any kind of change in my policy. And once there is a change, it's automatically and live updating the Opal client using WebSockets. And we can have many Opal clients, if you think about it, because maybe I have tons of users and tons of authorization queries, then I want a good scale um, of my clients. So Opal client will do the specific stuff. Opal client will get the policy in the one hand from the Opal server. And on the other hand, what Opal client can do is basically get data from wherever. We have something called data fetchers, which is kind of plugins to Opal. So Opal can fetch data from wherever you want. It can be APIs, it can be DBs. Uh, we already have many data fetchers uh, implemented by different kind of uh, people, um, obviously from the community. So you can also uh, pull data, like I said, from third parties. So you can choose Salesforce, Stripe, your cloud provider, and in the end of the day, Opal Client will now hold two things. One, updated policy, and two, updated data. Using these two things, I can make sure that my users are getting access control that is not only well-performed, it's also very updated. So Opal Client, uh, you can choose either to use Opa as the agent 
or AWS Cedar as the agent. Uh, so it's fully uh, scalable and flexible. And once Opal Client is up, your application can query uh, Opal with any kind of authorization query that you have in mind. And that's it. Um, if you want, we have a nice Slack community and the just all around authorization. Uh, you are more than welcome to join. You are welcome to grab me after and ask me whatever you want. I'm here to answer everything. And that was it. Thank you, everyone.